Hello. We'll wait a couple, <clears throat> a couple of minutes before getting started. Um, in general, I I ask students, uh, you know, unless they're, unless it's something that's invading their their privacy to be visible. Uh, so we have more of a class like like setting. I understand if you have to go off and and turn off the video, but I'd, I'd like to be able to for people to be able to see each other. Um, um, have people? I've gotten a number of emails. Uh, it seems as though the emails I have been sending out to the class have some of them have been going to spam. Is that? Have you guys been getting my emails? I mean, I, I send them out through the website, which has my my um, SIU email, which is WFREIVOG at SIU.edu. So that's what I've been sending out course emails. I probably have sent out three or four since I made the course go live around the beginning of the month. Um, so you might look in your spam filter to see what you've missed. I've asked Saluki Tech to try to figure out what the heck's going on. I also, I mean, the email that I really spend most of my time looking at it, although I get my SIU email fed into it, is um, is is the W Fry Vogel, my whole my first initial and my whole last name at at gmail.com. So um I don't know what your computer or your employer or what SIU is is blocking, but you you could run into that situation. Um, has anybody had that problem, or you've been getting my stuff? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, mine went to the spam folder in my email at um, the SIU email, but I definitely see the link on the homepage. So that's not a problem. And I just moved them from the spam folder into my inbox. So okay. now that I've done that, it prob they'll probably all go there to the inbox now. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> is everybody able to access the the online, pay the, the homepage for the course? Because uh, it has, I mean, you should spend a little time um, you should spend a little time going through it uh, to see what's there. Uh, uh, for example, there's one, one of the top announcements has summaries of each of the main units of the course. And you're going to definitely want to have looked at those at the one that has 334.1 and 334.2 before you take the test that's going to be available after uh, Thursday's class um, because the 334.2 has main points you need to know. <clears throat> um, the, the first test is is really the easiest. I, I don't think that you should find it to be too hard. We'll, um, we'll review for it uh, on thir uh, in our Thursday uh, discussion. Do you guys want to throw some, any, any, any questions that you have? Well, let me, let me first say, <clears throat> the, the, the way the course works is we have a Zoom discussion where I hope as many people can come as, as possible. There's 60 plus students, so obviously not everybody, <laughs> most people can't. Um, I, it's being uh, recorded uh, and I will then put the recording on YouTube so that those who didn't, weren't here uh, can, uh, can, can watch it. And then, the, so I'll, I'll give you all cr uh, uh, credit for being here. And then those who are just watching on YouTube, they can post uh, to the discussion, um, to the discussion number one tab, uh, like uh, tr truth, uh, truth or facts. Uh, 
on under the discussion uh, header and they can get, get credit that way. Um, so that's in general, this, that, that, the, so both your participation in this Zoom and discussion post that you make go to your class participation grade. Um, do you all have other questions you want to throw at me? One thing I want to do is to. Um, um, I was wondering for our discussion uh, posts, when we post on that, we read others' uh, discussion posts. Are we to comment on a certain number of our classmates or is or just reading their posts enough? Well, uh, it, it would be good to com comment on anything that looks interesting. What I will do, and I'll do this, um, I'll, I'll put a, a discussion thread uh, at the uh, at the top of discussion one, as well. But what 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 I generally do is I I have I post a thread, uh, which I didn't do before this class. I should have really. I post a thread uh, that then everybody can post on, and then you know you can read everybody's posts and just respond to whichever ones look interesting. So the, the we've already got sort of a problem with the discussion one thread where we have uh lots of threads so i will put i will put an overall discussion thread at the top that we that we can post on but if you see any other if anybody starts a thread that looks interesting to you uh you know just you can wherever you post it i will see it um other questions yeah um if we're here in the discussion today. Do we still have to post in the discussion post? I just, I don't know if I missed that. No, no you don't. Okay. So let me go down. Well, you, you keep throwing questions at me and I'm going to give you all um, credit for your discussion. Let's see, we have eight, so... Jesse, I'll tell you what, how about we go around the horn here and you just tell me a little bit about yourself and I'll give you credit while, while we're doing that. Um, just tell me like uh, where you're from, what you're majoring in, are you an online student only? Um, what do you want to do with your, with your education, with your life? <laughs> um, so why don't we just start at the top there, uh, Jesse? I've I've got you in front of me to to grade here. Hi, uh, I'm Jesse. Um, I just graduated uh, this week. Um, I'm taking this course as a prerequisite for uh, medical school I'm applying to. Uh, so that's my trajectory: is apply to med schools, hopefully get in. Uh, be a better Congratulations doctor. on graduating. Uh, where are you from? Oh, sorry. Uh, I, I've lived locally for the last uh, decade, but I'm originally from Streeter, Illinois, which is about uh, 45 minutes northeast of Bloomington Normal. I've been nowhere. there a long time ago. Um, so I'm, I'm basically, to the people who are participating in this Zoom, I'm, I'm basically giving uh, two points for for today and then you know like if, if people make certain comments i might add add some points um uh but if you if you see if you're on this uh zoom and you look at your grade you should see uh at least uh two points for each discussion that you're in and and discussion post it's like um um no maybe i'll we'll say three because I've got the discussion grade divided to two uh, of 10 each. So we'll say three. Um, what kind of doctor do you want to be? Uh, I'm looking to go into uh, family medicine. Uh, I've been a paramedic here in Jackson County for the past uh, 10 years. Oh. So uh, really enjoy the social aspects of medicine and want to be as involved in that as I can be going forward. 
Well, towards the end of this class, we'll be talking about the issues of informed consent and also it'll get around to some some of the things that you're uh, probably uh, most interested in. Ms. Cohen, what's your first name? Hi, um, I'm Lori, Lori Cohen. I'm okay. actually originally from Cobden, Illinois, which is just a little town south of Carbondale. You got peaches and down there, right? I am a radiation therapist and working at the SIH Cancer Institute. Um, and I am in the radiologic science management program, which is uh, like a healthcare management type program. Um, finishing up a degree that I started in 1988. So I'm non-traditional and all online. And um, maybe I can talk Jesse into becoming a radiation oncologist so that he can uh, like be my succession plan when uh, my doctors start retiring. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Andy, tell us where you're, where you're from, what you're what you're majoring in, where you are in school, uh, what your plans are. All right. Um, can everyone hear me? I'm technologically illiterate, so I'll start with that. Um, but I'm from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, I've been in the military and the Navy for like 10 years. I actually did a couple years at SIU back when most people go to college originally when I was 18, 19, had too much fun. So now I'm doing all this online during the military, during my time in the Navy, uh, criminal justice major, and I'm trying to possibly get out of the Navy, do something on the criminal justice realm, or pursue a legal career or something like that. Okay, well, I, I, I got my law degree when I was 51 years old, so there's, there's plenty of time. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> uh, Matthew. Sorry, I hit the wrong button there. It's okay. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Matt. Uh, I'm a political science pre-law major. Um, I'm from the Kankakee area of Illinois, about four hours north of here, and I'm a full-time student. What's your What's your major? Uh, political oh, science. Oh, you said political science, didn't you? Okay. Okay, great. Do you think you want to go to law school? Yes, uh, I'm taking the LSAT in April. Oh, good luck. You taking a, cor a course for it? Uh, not yet. I just bought a few books and reviewing them. Uh, I took the LSAT twice in my life, and mm -hmm. I, I didn't take a course. And when I, uh, when I took it the second time, I wished I had taken a course. So <laughs> I... Mm -hmm. I uh, I advise it's a good idea. Um, sometime, if you want, we can talk about law schools. If you if you know what yeah, kind of stuff you're looking for, I'd be glad to talk about about that. Yeah, um, that'd be great. Thank you. You're welcome, Brooke. I'm Brooke. Uh, I'm a junior from Tennessee, and I'm majoring in plant biology. I probably want to go into like mycology research, work in a lab. Nice. Well, you guys are all right along in your studies. Uh, sometimes I have people a little bit earlier in their in their careers. Um, where are you from? I'm from Tennessee. Oh, from Tennessee. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um. Ms. Weiss, how do we say your first name? Oh, Jarena? <laughs> You're muted. <laughs> can, can you unmute? I think if you just look on the uh, on the Zoom screen in the lower left, you should see a mute thing. Also on your picture, there's usually a, a thing that says uh, mute or unmute. Uh, 
I'll tell you what, okay, we're, if you, 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 you can, uh, you can come, if you get it unmuted, we'll talk. Okay. Gotcha. Let's see, Samuel, did we do you yet? No, we didn't. Um, I'm currently a senior a computer science major. Uh, I currently work full-time for AMRU as a software engineer and do application development. Um, I, I'm i from Chicago, um, uptown. Uh, yeah, that's all. I guess people, uh, I'm from St. Louis, so I don't even know what uptown means, but I'm figuring most of the people uh, on here do. Okay. Uh, is it is it Nomi? It's Noemi. Noemi, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, Okay, well, I'm Noemi. Um, I'm a computer and electrical engineer. Uh, I'm just in my senior year, so I'm hoping to graduate in May. Um, I'm from Chicago. Uh, I'm from Chicago. Uh, and that's all. I don't okay. really know what I want to do with my life, but. <laughs> Well, you got it. It looks like you have a little, little time to figure that out. Let's see. Who have I not done? Madeline. Hello. Hi. Um, um, I'm Madeline Hoke. I'm from Redbud, Illinois. Now I'm about an hour south of St. Louis, and my major is ag communications, and I'm a sophomore. Ag communication. So what kind, what do you want to do with ag uh, communications? I want to do marketing or PR within the agricultural industry. Okay, great. Okay, so I think I've got you all uh, recorded. You know, if you go back to your, your grade sheet and you don't find yourself having at least three points, send me an email and I'll fix that. Um, now that we have more people on, does anybody have a question that wasn't answered earlier? Did somebody just join us or are we, I think everybody, everybody introduced themselves, didn't they? No. Um, me. Oh, right, hi. Yeah. I gave you credit <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh, well, can so I tell me how to say myself. your first name? It's Jarena. Jarena, okay. Yes. I am a 43-year-old non-traditional student. I am returning back to college after 10 years um, with some health issues. So now I'm back and I am a mass communications and media studies student. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you just a little bit about myself, a little more about the course. We're going to go will be uh, shorter to shorter today than the 90 minutes. Um, I publish a magazine called the Gateway Journalism Review, and I am on a proofing deadline. It goes to the press tomorrow morning. And so I, I got to get back at that. Um, so I have uh, been at SIU for 16 years. For that, I was um, I was a reporter for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Uh, for 34 years, uh, 10 of the uh, 12 of them in Washington D.C. covering the U.S. Supreme Court, the the Journalism Review magazine I'm putting out right now is all about the Supreme Court. I'll I'll send you guys a link and you can it'll help put you to sleep at night. Um, and uh, went back to, as I mentioned earlier, I went back to law school when I was uh, 45 graduated when I was 51. Um, uh, I've, my, my main passions are uh, Supreme Court, civil rights, civil liberties. Uh, that's what I've written about mostly. I still consider myself a, an active journalist. Um, I've done you know, investigative projects each of the last, um, well, just about every year of my life, to be honest with you, but up, up, up and including this one. 
Um, last year, I, I did an investigative project with a bunch of student journalists on police accountability. Um, so that's, um, so I consider myself uh, uh, really a, a journalist first and a, a lawyer second and college professor <laughs> along with that. I'm teaching mostly online. I live in St. Louis. Um, so these online courses will work out well for me. Uh, I have uh, most of the 16 years at SIU, the, the first ones of which I was director of the School of Journalism. Uh, I commuted from St. Louis several times a week, you know, three or four times a week. So I, I, I went through Red Bud a lot. I can't remember which one of you is, is from Red Bud, but um, I passed through your city, probably speeding too often. Uh, I, I try not to um, uh, commute quite as much these days because I, in my 16 years, I've wrecked five cars. Uh, <laughs> fortunately, I, I was, uh, I had, a, I had a, a deer, a coyote, a pickup truck, and hydroplaned on a, uh, on Highway 3 and went into the woods. So I'm trying to avoid that. Uh, since I'm now 73, I really don't want to uh, don't want to take too many chances um so that we'll always begin the class the so we're having eight there'll be eight zooms uh sort of just for each unit um the first half of the course is primarily about uh or that, that's not true then the first i guess maybe the first quarter of the class is about uh, journalism ethics. Then we move on to legal ethics. Uh, then a, 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 a whole smattering of sort of social issues that have have thorny ethical components. And um, uh, then we read the uh, the um, the book on. Uh, uh, informed consent and then we review for the final basically so that's that's just a brief sketch of how the course plays out um, people usually uh, do well all of the uh, all of the the all of the tests are uh, are online and there is a, a a, 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 a sheet with the main components of each um, of each unit that's available that helps to have in front of you when you take the test. Um, um, what else do you so so as as I was saying before, some of you came on. Make sure you go to the home page and you look around amongst all those announcements uh and see what's available before the next class on thursday um read through the there's a there's a there's an announcement that says photo j ethics photojournalism ethics and there's an attachment there which says sherida um sherida used to be uh used to be our office manager and so when she was copy these things for posting she she it has her name on it and um so this is a this is a um an attachment that is titled uh, once you open it is titled news gathering torts it, it, it's these are these are law decisions so those of you are going on to law school you get give you a little taste of what you could be in for um they're all they are all uh, cases that sort of um, have the have a clash between n news gathering imperatives and uh, privacy issues. Uh, you know, like when can when can you cross a when can a journalist cross a police line, which is never. Um, uh, when uh, can 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 you go into somebody's living room for an interview and secretly uh, tape record and videotape them, which is basically no. Um, uh, can you go be an undercover reporter 
getting a job at some place of business and then writing a story about it without telling your your uh, without telling your employer, which which is sometimes, but you got to be careful. <laughs> anyway, so so don't read. You don't have to read that. I mean, I have marked all these up with like the important points. You know, I've just underlined them. Uh, it's, it's a handout I've used a lot. Uh, don't don't feel like you have to read these like a court decision where you understand all of the reasoning of the court, but just read them to get the main the main points. Like one's about one, one of them, which is called Shulman S H U L M A N. Uh, it's about um, um, it's about a you know, a, a, a car wreck uh, on a highway. A person's trapped in the car uh paramedics come one of you is a paramedic right paramedics come the the paramedic uh organization has agreed with a local tv station to be wired up a nurse ca crawls in under the car and is recording the conversation of the trapped person under the car and then in a helicopter being conveyed to the hospital what are the privacy rights there uh so for the third we'll talk we'll talk about those cases on thursday um and that is a rather long handout so it's gonna take you a little time to get through it don't feel like you have to understand the legal aspects the main legal the legal point to understand about privacy is that the most important question in any case involving privacy is what is the person's expectation of privacy under the circumstances? Um, you know, so if you're in your house, you got a high expectation of privacy. If you're walking along the street, you don't have much of an ex. You have no expectation of privacy. Um, so we'll talk. We'll talk a lot more about about that. But I just want to warn you so you get a chance to to read through it before our next class. Um, any questions so far? So what let's talk uh, let's talk briefly about I think people have posted about this quite a bit. Uh, what it, what is a journalist? Well, for, first of all, in the newsroom video, most of my class, and I think that most of the discussion posts have said this. Uh, most uh, most folks like the anchor when he gives up the objectivity guys and is real, even though he's saying things that maybe people don't want to hear about about the United States. Um, but what did you what did you guys think? Is that the way you felt, or or uh, what were your reactions to that? So <clears throat> I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed like he actually was objective in the latter half of his um, diatribe, for diatribe. lack of a better word, <laughs> right? Uh, so at the beginning, it was like, why is America the greatest country in the world? And then I don't remember it verbatim, but he was like, or do you think America is the greatest country in the world? And he said, yes, right? And I think that was more subjective, right? That's a subjective question because most people have different views on what makes the best country in the world, right? More people are just patriotic than others. Or some people are just not from America, right? So why would you think that America is the greatest country in the world if you're from Canada and you love Canada, right? Fly that flag. He was objective, I think, when he started saying facts on why he thought that maybe America was not the greatest country in the world anymore. So I think there was two different portions of that. It wasn't just black and white. It was like, he was objective when he was stating what we lead in the top three things. I think it was uh, incarcerated individuals, uh, military spending, and then um, and something else, angels, right? I don't know how you prove that, but sure. But then he was subjective in his assessment of what those things meant and why he thought that that made us not the greatest country in the world, right? And then he said, this is the worst 
generation. Well, all right, according to him, maybe, right? But the generations came up with, you know, the iPhone and stuff like that. So it, I think saying whether or not, I think he ran a, a good middle ground of whether or not he was being objective or subjective. And so I don't know if I, I think like, maybe most people thought that the beginning where he was just like, yes, it's the greatest country is where he was being objective and a journalist. But I think being a journalist, he was when he was stating all the facts that he was stating off. And then when yeah. he started giving his opinions on the facts, I think that's where it kind of, I mean, I think I'd like to hear your opinion on that, but I think I like both, right? If you can give us the facts and then give us an analysis <laughs> of the facts, I think you're doing a good job. Yeah. I mean, uh, what you say really resonates with me. I mean, I'm a, so like I say, I've been a reporter most my, all my life, 50 years, and um, all my professional career. And I became a reporter because I wanted to, um, well, well, partly because I was nosy, but also because I wanted to like, answer questions that I wondered about. And I wanted to make society better. A lot of reporters have that kind of, that kind of um, motivation. And so the, the, the whole time that I've been a journalist, there's always this sort of push and pull between, um, so, you know, do we just state the facts or do, you know, or, or do we have to go farther and provide the context, uh, you know, historical context? This project I'm, I'm proofreading on the Supreme Court, I mean, I've tried to do sort of what you're talking about. Like I, I'll... I have a story about all the things that were missing from the original constitution, uh, like equality, uh, liberty, democracy, right to vote, uh, any rights for women, any rights for blacks, a lot of things were missing. Um, but then, you know, just put it in the context of how there have been all of these controversies and cases and movements that have, injected all of those values that I that were missing originally into the Constitution as it's as it's uh, interpreted today so um, you know I, I think it's important it's important the, the the sort of he said she said kind of journalism um, without the context uh, can um, uh, really doesn't get you close to the truth. And I think the so the truth, truth based upon facts is is sort of what I would say a journalist is 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 trying to get at. People have other ideas? I, I noticed somebody posted uh in the discussion a comment that if the media don't like a story they don't publish it. What do you think about that? Um, I actually was the one that said that. I think that sometimes um, it's it's more of opinions that they want to put out instead of just news. Like, I just want to hear the news. I want to know what's happening. I want it to be substantive. I want it to be truthful. And I want it to be fact-checked but I don't want everyone's opinion. Um, I just want news for news sake, basically. So a, um, I mean, an issue that journalists have had to face in the, in the Donald Trump era has been if the president of the United States or the former president says something that's factually untrue, do you actually say it's untrue? I mean, before Donald Trump, in general, mainstream media, you know, Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, um, LA Times, uh, NPR, would not say that something was false. They would say, here's what he, here's what he said, and here's the facts. Well, I mean, <clears throat> particularly, you know, as, as we've gotten to issues like who won the last election, uh, almost all of the media say that that Donald Trump's um, election claims are false. So they stay it flat out. Um, now is that an opinion? 
Or is that just the context? You know, given that 60 plus courts with including Trump justices, ju judges and justices have rejected it. Um, what do you think? So I, I guess I would, that's an interesting point because I guess you have fact, right? When Donald Trump was elected and he was abrasive, I would say at, at best to some, um, there was like fact checking, right? And we'd have websites that were fact checking. Right, fact checking. Right, yeah. but, but then it would come out where there's another website that is fact checking the fact checkers and on and on we go that's, in this. That's true. Yeah. So, and I guess just looking at the news for news sake, right? Because I think when it comes back to like subjective and objective, it's like, I want to hear the objective, like I want to hear what is happening in the world. And then I would like to be able to make my own informed opinions. And I think sometimes we do run into that, even fact checkers, where it's like, are you fact checking based on facts or your opinion? And then how, how can we have a fact checker and then a fact checker fact checking the fact checker? It doesn't, right? Shouldn't, shouldn't at one point, it's just like, this is a fact. Right. So is it a fact that Joe Biden won the last election? I mean, I would say that's a fact. He got the most electoral votes. He's According sitting in the White the House. Vote, it's a fact. All of the claims, <laughs> uh, all of the court claims of fraud were rejected by the courts. And the Trump Justice Department that investigated the claims of fraud found them to not be true. So how much farther do you have to go than, to, than that to say that it's it's true that Joe Biden is president and that he was the election was not stolen can we establish that as a fact i mean i'm sure that I donald trump we... would say no <laughs> <laughs> but and and a lot of folks uh you know who support him would 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 say no but there still hasn't been any corroboration of any of those fraud claims um so that you know that's a and i'll give you an example just you know for the sake of uh, uh well it's, this is an interesting story um there there was a there was a recent story that showed that before the 2020 election you may remember the new york post which is a a, a rather conservative paper uh had a story that said that Hunter Biden's laptop had been found and had all sorts of informa compromising information on it and was being looked at by federal authorities. And uh, some of the people in the Democratic Party said, this is just more of what happened before the 2016 election. This is disinformation coming from uh, you know, coming from the Russians, uh, and uh, Twitter initially uh, used some of it, some of the software it uses to block uh, child porn, uh, used that software to block the distribution of the New York Post uh, st story on, on Twitter. And uh, Eventually, a couple of weeks later, the um, uh, Jack Dorsey, who was then president or CEO of Twitter, admitted that they shouldn't have done that. Um, so there's there's an example that sort of uh, uh, bears out a little bit about what you're saying. There, there, you know, maybe that was information that that the people running Twitter or the, the, the more liberal media didn't want uh, to put out there. Uh, it was right before the election. It was uh, maybe a month before the election. Uh, and um, so, I mean, you certainly can see that uh, the, with the way the media has become so sort of um, 
divided into camps. Um, you know, you still have the mainstream media that, um, like the New York Times, Washington Post, um, NPR, um, that tries to use professional journalism ethics in the way they present the news and present all, both sides. But uh, certainly there are lots of uh, cable outlets that are very much slanted one way or the other, you know, Fox one way, uh, MSNBC the other way. Um, CNN is sort of changing around right now. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, so that's, a, you know, that's something we wrestle with all the time. And, and you know, with, with, the, with the explosion, I mean, the media has revolutionized in the last 20 years. Uh, and <clears throat> newspapers like the one I used to work for, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, are, are shadows of their former selves. There were about 400 uh, editorial employees when I was there. There was fewer than 100. The circulation was 400,000. Now it's under 100,000. We had a, uh, my wife and I worked in a eight person Washington bureau for the Post Dispatch writing about national stories that affected St. Louis in particular. There's nobody who writes about, there's nobody in the Washington bureau of the Post Dispatch. So that's an example of how the traditional papers have really shrunk. You know, meanwhile, I mean, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, um, Snapchat. I mean, they're providing more of the news. More people are getting their news from those those sources. TikTok uh, from those sources than than uh, uh, than they are from the, the hometown newspaper or radio station or TV station. And you and you certainly have to be. Uh, I mean, I feel like when, when I when I look at TikTok, I feel like I have to use all my skills of fifty years as a journalist to figure out what's true and what isn't true. Uh, I mean, the key thing is to figure out, you know, who who amongst the sources you, you're hearing from are 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 people. You know, what what is the source of information? Is it a is it a reputable source of information or not? And you know, are they are the people who are putting out news and information? Are they providing you know proof of what they're saying? Um, so the whole issue of media literacy is is super important. Um, let's talk a little bit about about the philosophers quite a bit of the first uh test I, I probably before i go on anybody want to say anything about that disagree with me uh agree with me have a totally different view okay so we'll we'll, we'll talk about uh quite a bit of the first test is going to be about the the traditional uh, uh, the traditional philosophers, Western philosophers, uh, primarily, you know, we discuss in this in this course, um, and uh, so, you know, I you I want you to at least understand the the basics of of each of these philosophers' um, uh, beliefs. You know, Immanuel Kant, Universal Law, Categorical Imperative, John Stuart Mill, Greater Good, Utilitarianism, uh, Aristotle, a Greek philosopher, Golden Mean, Rawl, I guess it's Rawls, John Rawls, The Veil of Ignorance. Um, and then uh, the, 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 there's something called the Potter's Box, which we'll talk about a little bit, which is sort of a a system for um, it, it's a it's like a four quadrant box that helps you work through the issues that are uh, relevant to making an ethical decision. What's the, what's the difference with uh, w w w amongst those 
philosophers to the extent that you've read some of the first chapters on what they believe. Is there a particular philosopher who appeals to you or is, is it a, do you think different philosophies for different circumstances? What do you think? I, I think I aligned most with uh, uh, Ross's uh, plural, uh, pluralistic theory, uh, just the idea that we can have multiple uh, ethical choices uh, based on the situation and to, to whom we have a duty, and they can be conflicting. There can be multiple right choices or more right choices makes it more of a, a gradient or a scale rather than a uh, toggle, I guess, of this was right or this was wrong. So explain that a little more. That's interesting. Uh, uh, on which point? So which philosopher are you talking about? Uh, William David Ross. Oh, okay. Do you do you know more about him? Uh, I had not read much philosophy until uh, reading these chapters, uh, yeah. so I don't know anything else about him. Okay, so uh, pluralistic philosophy, right? That there, what gradients of right and wrong? Yeah, uh, that was my in interpretation of their uh, synopsis of his uh, philosophy. Yeah. So so uh, the the um so the, the Potter box is they, did anybody master what the Potter box is? Potter was a, a Harvard Harvard uh, uh, ethics professor I think. Uh, so he he, has, he he says take an ethical decision through four quad quadrants of this sort of decision making box and the upper left corner is uh you know pull together all the facts you know what so what is what what, what happened and what is the ethical issue uh and then the uh, uh lower left quadrant is um what are you know what are the values that you're that you believe in and that you're going to apply in making your decision. Um, and uh, the lower right quadrant, what are the, what are the principles uh, you know, that, that you're going to apply? And the upper right quadrant is, who, who, what are your loyalties? I mean, is your loyalty to, like in the case of a newspaper, to, your, to its readers or to its publisher or to the community? Um, and then you you sort of like work the facts through those uh, those quadrants to come come up with a decision. Um, what about the rest of you? Uh, any particular um, philosophers who make sense to you? Well, for me. Um... I agree with uh, some of what everyone, all of the philosophers, but uh, Mill, uh -huh. um, because of the outcome of the situation, like I'd be focused on, you know, the outcome and um, I guess that's what, you know, would determine what decisions would be right. Just my what I took from it right so uh, <clears throat> Mill who was a <clears throat> excuse me was an enlightenment era philosopher um, was uh, you know basically believed in utilitarianism the greater good um, yes um, did, did, did the did, did, did any of you read the um, the example of the girls falling from the fire escape in Boston. Um, so this is a 
th this is a case where a number of years ago, uh, two young girls uh, were trying to escape a fire uh, and uh, fell from the fire escape, one of them to her death and the other one injured. The Boston Herald American had a reporter on the scene who was taking a picture, taking a series of pictures. They, Boston American uh, uh, was a, is a tabloid paper and the whole front cover the next day was about had the picture of the girls falling to their deaths. So it was this uh, very vivid, it's very and disturbing picture of of a girl falling, uh, you know, seconds away from dying. And um, the 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 newspaper ran that big, and then they followed up as news organizations often do with, well, so you know, why are these fire escapes? dangerous what's the city going to do about it there, the result of it was that there was a uh, city hall passed a uh, measure to get fire escapes fixed so they were safer around the city so there was a good sort of reform result that was certainly triggered by the in, in part or maybe even to a large extent by the by the emotional response to that photo um uh, but the you know so the question the question is um, I mean a lot of my students say well shouldn't the families of the girls who died have had to agree to let that picture be run um, what do you all think and and I and I think Mill so you know Mill sort of is is something interesting to you know to to consider uh, in that regard you know is there is the greater good that they fix the fires, the community fix the fire escapes? Um, or do you have a loyalty to your fellow person, the parents of the of the dead girls to 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 you know not expose their grief across the entire in, entire universe uh, and, and city? Um, what do you think? I think the loyalty should be to fix the fire escape to prevent for the tragedy so you and i you understand the the you know the family's perspective but if it can prevent uh further tragedies i think that the loyalty should go there is there yeah so i think um all right i was just gonna think like um it's obviously easier to say when you're not in that situation but um i think like shouldn't the family like not want them to die in vain kind of in a way like I know that's kind of like a weird thing to say but um at least like by seeing the image even though it's graphic and horrible and you don't want to see your your family like that that at least it's getting the message across and that won't happen to another person right what do other people think I also think it did it seemed like that the uh, photographer did kind of like adhere to the privacy of and the grief of the families because it says that she had pick or he or she or whoever it was but had pictures of the girls like dead on the ground and refused to publish those so I, I think they did a good job of towing that line I mean it's tough but that's a that's a story that needs to be reported right and if other people have these fire escapes or faulty like and you know about it, don't you, as a journalist, don't you have a duty to report that? So I think they towed a, a good line there with how they well, made that. that. that that's, that's a good point to make. Yeah, I mean, a picture of the dead girls on the, you know, a gruesome picture like that would have been, you know, very, very disturbing. And, and you know, this sort of gets actually to another one of the, the philosophers, you know, one of the Aristotle ten, tenets is to, um, uh, sometimes try to look for a golden mean uh, and you know what maybe that was sort of the golden mean for for this newspaper is to you know not not run the most graphic but but run run uh, still something that 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 tells the story and, and that uh, has emotional content um, I mean another 
another way to do it would be not make it they 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 didn't necessarily have to make it their whole cover of their tabloid you know sometimes they <clears throat> sometimes a news organization will will run an editor's note that explains what they did i mean i think to a certain extent and i, and I don't know what they they um uh did in this case but it seems like you you should call up the family to let them know what you're running so it doesn't just arrive on their front porch the next day um uh, and explain why you're doing it um a lot of my students think they should let the parents or the relatives decide uh, my my view as a journalist would be you can't really let the subject of a story decide your news your news coverage and what you print that's got to be a decision you make yourself as a as a professional journalist um but but I, I most of most of my students disagree uh with me about that um another sim uh i think i have a link for this in the syllabus there's a there's a there was a, a, a story about and we'll talk about this a bit more on thursday when we talk about photojournalism ethics and journalism ethics versus privacy but there's a famous photograph from the vietnam war called uh, it's referred to oftentimes as the napalm girl have you guys seen this picture uh, this is a picture of a little girl um i don't know 10 maybe uh running from a village in south vietnam after south south vietnamese airplanes you know supported by the, by the united states had bombed her village with napalm and her clothes had, ca had caught on fire and she and her and the other children were running down a road and there's a picture of her uh, and she has pulled her clothes off uh, and so she's bur she's burned uh, her entire body is visible uh, and this was a picture that was sent along by the photographer in the field his last name is ut ut and initially the uh, initially uh you i think it was upi was not going to run it then they decided to run it they were not going to run it because of the the uh, of the uh, you know it was a young girl naked and they decided they would run it and it was probably the most memorable image from the entire Vietnam War made a lot of Americans wonder what the heck we were doing, um, and um, the the sort of the the full st the full story is that the photographer, after taking the picture, took the girl to to the hospital. They they remained as long as they as, as the photographer was alive. They he died recently. They remained friends uh she went she eventually got to canada she runs a uh she runs a nonprofit to help victims of war um uh so that's how it all turned out but that was certainly a very tough kind of ethical decision where you um i mean you, you probably couldn't even contact they probably i don't think they had contact with the parents of the of the girl at that point um it, uh, anybody have any thoughts about that about that or any of these other sort of ethical issues um i just have a quick comment because i heard it over the weekend i saw an image of the like omira sanchez i don't know if you've ever seen that image but it's uh she was like after like post volcano um, she was like stuck under a whole bunch of debris and like water and the photographer just captured images of like her dying because she was stuck under there. There was nothing they could do to get her out, um, but she was stuck up to like 40 something hours, I think, and she just died of like hypothermia, I think. And I don't know, that just reminded me of that story because I don't know, I saw those images and I was like, why is a photographer just like taking pictures rather than like helping the person? Um, but I don't know. I just wanted this comment. On well, that's that. a really good question. I mean, I think most most war photographers will tell you that they feel as though, you know, while they're trying to capture the the image in the moment, that they feel like they have a they have a responsibility as a person to help 
somebody in a situation like that? I mean, I don't know all the details of, I mean, could he have done something to free her? No, I'm pretty sure. I think it was just to show how bad the like rescue efforts on far as like the government, um, because she there was no way she was like getting out of there. I don't think, but no. it's just sad that like the photographer spent her final hours with just like I don't know. It doesn't it doesn't sit right with me, but like you know, he was trying to depict something like a an issue. So I guess. Yeah. Well, it, that 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 is there, there was a there was a a photograph. By the way, the Boston Herald, the Boston Americans picture of the fire escape won a Pulitzer Prize for the best photograph of the year. Uh, another photograph that won a Pulitzer Prize <coughs> was of uh, a little a little kid in Africa dying of malnutrition, and uh, the uh, photographer there there was a vulture near the child, and the photographer waited for the vulture to flap its wings to take the photograph and, and there was a lot of criticism of him for that what people didn't realize is that he had then gotten the girl to or the the child i can't remember if it was a boy or girl to uh to help them um you know to, to a clinic to, to help her she the, the child died anyway um and then that photographer a couple of years later committed suicide. Uh, so it was it was very trauma, it was traumatic for him as uh, for him as well. Um, let's see, couple other points. What's the difference between uh, law and ethics? I mean, law is basically what you what what you must do, and ethics is what you should do. Um, I mean, in the in the best of all worlds, laws will be ethical, but they they certainly aren't always. I mean, take the you know segregation laws in in, in America, legal segregation laws. They they people had to follow them. Uh, well, unless they w wanted to protest them and get arrested, which is how the laws got changed, but um, they certainly weren't ethical. Um, you know, there used to be laws against same same sex sex and mar and marriage, and um, you know, so you know you can uh, address that for the question of were those laws ethical uh, or not. And for some folks, that that brings in a religious component as well. I mean, ethics and religion aren't synonymous, just like law, just like ethics and law are not synonymous. Uh, so you may well have a religious component that makes you believe that same-sex relations and marriages are sin, um, and, and that that factors into your uh into your decision um so I, i'm going to stop there and um we'll go off the full 90 minutes on thursday uh and um make and, and take a look at that photojournalism news gathering towards handout that's on the photojournalism ethics um, um, announcement on the homepage. And any other questions? You can, as I say on the main announcement, welcoming announcement, you can get extra credit by bringing an ethical issue you see in the news to the class. We'll always start with, does anybody have an ethical issue they saw in the news or Write a report about a movie you uh, um, a movie you saw that has an ethical component. Uh, All the President's Men, for example, on the Watergate journalists and their ethical issues. Spotlight is a good one uh, on the Boston Globe journalists who um, uh, uncovered priest priest abuse in Boston. Um, that's a that's a way to get extra credit is to watch a movie and. Write me a 400, 
word essay. That just counts in an extra credit grade. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks for being here and see you on Thursday. See you Thursday. Um, I have a quick question. Um, sure. I jumped in the Zoom a little late. Um, I saw you put the grade in for the discussion. Is yeah. there a reason why it's three out of 10, just to make well, sense of it? Because 10 is for the four, full first half of the class. Okay, okay, I got, I got you. So uh, you, you, I, I would sometimes then add to that. So, so after four of the eight, after four of the eight discussions, you'll want to be as close to 10 as possible. So. Okay. Okay. That makes so, so much sense. Okay. Okay. okay great. Thank you. Okay. Have a great day. Uh, you too. Bye -bye. And real quick for me, yeah. uh, I just wanted to make sure, uh, cause I asked the question earlier, but, um, so the, uh, the, the first discussion post, um, that was posted, uh, since we attended here, we don't have to post in that. Just, you, just to make you, sure. you do not. Okay. You're okay. welcome to, but you do not. Okay. And um, I did want to uh, clarify uh, earlier. It was going a little faster, but the uh, I, I did notify you about the emails going to spam. I think it was because uh, it, they were coming from your Gmail to our SIU accounts, so that's why I was going to the spam. But now your uh, new emails are coming from your SIU email. What I don't understand is that I was writing those emails. Um. That seemed to have gone to spam from from the website for the class, which just has my SIU email. So, but thanks for uh, uh, you know if, if it's the Gmail, I I can sort of understand. Um, so I'm glad to know that's what it was. Yep, no problem. Okay, great. Right. Thanks. Thank you. See you soon. All right.